So hello everyone and good morning uh, to you and welcome to the second of the eight part seminar series on the topic of discussion for today being, can Africa be food secure by 2063? Africa's um, agricultural futures and impact of a green revolution. My name is Pamela Gopal and I'm the lead um, program um, uh, coordinator of the Policy Bridge Tank Program at the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. For those of you that are joining for the first time, uh, as mentioned, this is the second of an eight part series where each of the session will focus on a specific development area and ultimately the outcomes of the discussion will serve as an input into a think tank inception conference that we plan to hold from the 26th to the 28th of September in Addis Ababa on Africa's integrated development prospects. So the NEPAD um, African Union Development Agency Africa Policy Bridge Tank Program in collaboration with Africa, African Futures and Innovation Program at the Institute for Security Studies is jointly hosting the seminar which aims to describe the context of agricultural production in Africa and how the sector can impact the continent's development trajectory. It is said that the future of Africa depends on agriculture and indeed a promising transformation has already started in Africa's farmlands. Family farmers are increasingly using innovative approaches and significant research combined with traditional knowledge to increase productivity in their fields. They're trying to diversify their crops as well as boost and include nutritional benefits at the same time, build in the climate resilience. So before I hand over today to our presenter, I would like to encourage all the participants to please post your questions as uh, we want to be able to provide sufficient time to address all your comments and your questions. Today, our presenter is Ms. Alice Leroux, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies. Alice has extensive experience in providing four sites on the use in planning and decision making. She has a background in disaster risk production, reduction and climate change adaptation and has authored and co-authored more than 30 books chapters, journals, and conference papers on these topics. Alice holds a master's in geographical sciences from the University of Utrecht in, in the Netherlands, and is currently serving on the board of directors of the Climate Disaster and Resilience Fund. Alice will be presenting an agricultural scenario showing how farming with the growth mindset can improve agricultural productivity and benefit Africa's development outlook. Alice, thank you for availing us your time today and with your insights, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the series. So around a year ago, the Institute launched the African Futures and Innovation website that I'm going to display on the screen right now. We will be presenting from Okay, great. You should be able to see that. So this is a this is, thank you. Great, thank you. So this is a gateway. It's a it's a portal to enormous amount of scientific and quantitative data on the future of Africa. So forecasting information for each of Africa's 54 countries, various regional economic communities, and also various income groups. I want to mention that. All of the forecasts on the website and that you're going to see today and that I'm going to display on the screen uses a single global integrated assessment model that's called the International Futures or the IFS modeling platform, which is being updated and it's being hosted by our friends over at the University of Denver. It's an eight part Eurodite series that Pamela now referred to um, with all its associated material is also located on the website and that's what we use to present from. And we um, start, to, and, and that's what I'm going to present on today as well. And when we start this conversation around the future of Africa, we depart from what we call Africa's current path, which is located here. It is a forecast that takes into account where Africa is currently heading its most likely path, given current development policies and practices. 
And this really tells us the story of, of how we think Africa is going to evolve and unfold in the next two or so decades. And then we look at eight sectoral scenarios and we, and we ask the question, what can we change in its future to be able to make it look brighter and more prosperous? So last week, Yaki kicked off the seminar series by looking at the demographic theme. And he examined the impact of a more rapid demographic transition on Africa's future. Today, we are unpacking agriculture and we look at the future of agriculture on the continent and what it means for the continent. In the next six series, we will unpack um, the impacts of better education, governance, manufacturing, the continental free trade area, leapfrogging, and also the impact of better financial flows. So for each one of these scenarios, we also um, examine then their impact on the current path. And then this culminates into what we call a combined agenda 2063 scenario that we will present, as Pamela mentioned, in a joint conference with Oda Nepad in Addis Ababa in September this year. Today, we ask the question, where is Africa's agricultural sector heading? on its current path, and what is the impact of an agricultural revolution on the continent? And to answer this question, we're gonna go into the agricultural theme. And I'm going to start our conversation with displaying this chart that shows yield per hectare on the, Afri on the African continent in comparison to the rest of the world. Okay, so this shows yields per hectare from 1960 all the way through to 2043. What you will note is if I go through many of these graphs today, is that all of our forecasts span to the year 2043. Why we have chosen 2043 as the forecast horizon is that this is the end of the third 10 year implementation plan of Agenda 2063. So we align our forecast to that of the Africa Union's reporting timeframes. So you will see here in the green line on the screen displayed, but Africa has the lowest yields in the world. In 1961, this was 1.1 metric tons per hectare. And in 2023, this was 4.3 tons per hectare. You can see that Africa's agriculture sector has improved. You can see yields picking up here, but it took an extremely long time. And you also don't see this jump that you see in the other countries. And this is because Africa has not experienced an agricultural revolution like the rest of the world. If we look at South America, which is this orange line located here, you can see an enormous jump here from the 80s yeah, up and all the way through to 2020. They managed to achieve this through bettering their agricultural inputs, better fertilizer use, mechanization of the sector, improved seedlings, and so forth. But many things that the African agriculture sector has started to adopt, but not has not taken full advantage of as yet. So when we look at this graph and we look at this green line that is that is very slow, not really picking up a lot, lot, lots of efforts, there are actually five reasons, although there are actually many reasons, but I'm going to talk about five reasons behind the slow increase in production. So I think the first thing that I want to mention is the historical low levels of investment in the sector. The second one is a lack of land reform policies. Much of Africa's agriculture is being produced by subsistence farmers. We know this on small parcels of land, many of these without land tenure. So it's currently estimated that around 90% of the rural land in Africa is not formally documented. Um, the continuous use of traditional farming methods. Other countries have um, really adopted better inputs from, that translates to higher productivities and we're not seeing this transpire and translate in Africa. Conflict is also a big factor, especially endemic conflict. That affects agricultural production. A good example of this is the DRC. It boasts enormous fertile land. Some suggest that it has the potential to feed the entire continent, but the country battles high levels of malnutrition and only 10% of its arable land is currently cultivated. And then the last factor that I just wanna mention is poor land use practices. Uh, techniques like slash and burn, um, this, leads, this leads to degradation, soil erosion, which leads to increased flooding, topsoil losses, and that again impacts on productivity. Another example of poor land use practices is, for, is rampant deforestation, 
which we know is, 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 is a problem in Africa, which also again leads to water imbalances, increased runoffs, and biodiversity loss. Okay, so all of these factors lead to uh, low agricultural production, which brings me to my next graph that I want to show you. It shows the production on the continent. So this graph shows the production in Mexico from 1970 with a forecast horizon 2045. So the blue bars represent production and the orange bars represent demand. A clear signal here is the growing demand in orange, which you can see that's unable to be met with local production, which is the blue graphs or the blue bars. Uh, what this picture also clearly shows us is this growing and worrying trend in food insecurity. We know that currently Africa is the most food insecure region uh, in the globe. Uh, we, we've seen under enrichment increase since 2015. And I think we should also bear in mind that the sustainable development goal is to achieve zero hunger by 2030. And something that we know is a far way off on the continent. Hunger, malnutrition, these are two of the three most well-established causes and symptoms of Africa's underdevelopment. High inequality, coupled with these low levels of productivity that's clearly visible on this graph, contributes to slow levels of poverty reduction on the continent. And we know this is something that the continent struggle with. So there are, of course, exceptions. I mean, this is, this is one graph showing you Africa, which is an oversimplification. If we think of countries like Egypt, they are amongst the top 15 most productive cereal producers in the world. But in the same breath, Africa has 16 of the 20 lowest yield producing countries in the world. So it is a problem. Um, if we just talk about Egypt for a second, um, they managed to double their yields between 1970 and 2000. Like what we saw with that graph where Brazil, Brazil also increased its yields. And it was similar. It was targeted strategies and policies, which included things like land reform policies, expansion of the irrigation system, higher yielding crop varieties, the use of fertilizer that they started really adopting, and also increased investments into the sector. So this picture and this picture that's now on the screen is really something that needs to be corrected. And it is possible. Africa has, we know this massive untapped agricultural potential, million hec millions of hectares of arable land. The World Bank recently noted that Africa has 45% of the world's total surface area that's suitable for sustainable production and expansion. So lots and lots and lots of potential. Which brings us to the question, how do we unlock this agricultural potential and how do we start an agricultural revolution on the continent? And for that, I wanna open our scenario diagram where we've mapped some of this out and some of the key and critical interventions that we've modeled. And while this is a bit of a technical diagram, I am going to take you through this. So we um, strive here in this scenario to achieve five key outcomes in this light blue. So the first thing is to have a more productive agricultural sector. And the quickest way to achieve this is to improve our agricultural inputs on the continent. Uh, again, increase fertilizer use. Uh, this is still very, very, very sporadic on the continent. The uptake is low. Uh, the access is constrained in many cases. Modern, modernizing land tenure system. This is also a very, very effective way of quickly increasing productivity, including um, things like securing land tenure, improving access to better seedlings, particularly on the African continent, drought resistant and higher yielding seedlings. And then things like modern farming techniques, so precision, mechanized farming equipment, satellite monitoring, early warning systems, sensors, access to information on crop rotation. These are all very, very potent ways to improve productivity and efficiency. Um, there are initiatives that's doing this. Uh, Pamela also mentioned them. And I think one of the good examples is the Green Revolution um, program. But in, and that involves both public but also private initiatives that really focuses on producing and distributing improved seedlings on the continent, fertilizer use, and also pesticide use. Okay, then the second um, key outcome is to ensure we have and we safeguard Africa's agricultural sector against natural hazards, specifically rainfall variability. This is really, really very, very critical on the continent. Extreme weather-related events 
are detrimental to the sector. We've seen this. We've seen the flooding in Malawi just a couple of months ago and how that eroded their food resources. Africa's agricultural sector isn't climate smart, and it's definitely not able to withstand natural hazards. So over the last 100 years, the continent has battled more than 350 extreme drought events. But what is more concerning than the 350 drought events is that half of those events led to either a food shortage or to a famine, which clearly shows us that the sector is not able to withstand the onslaught of these hazards. And it goes the same for cyclones, floods, tropical storms, cuts of low systems. They all cause devastation and productivity on the continent. Africa has to adopt climate smart agricultural practices. Um, things like, for instance, irrigation systems. Uh, irrigation was one of the key components in Asia's green revolution, again in Brazil's and also in Egypt's. Africa is about only 5% of its cropland that is currently under irrigation. And this compares to a global average of 21%. So it's really, really lagging behind in this account. Um, securing water access to farmers. Uh, one, one such way, of course, is groundwater resources. Uh, we are um, aware of that groundwater extraction should, of course, be very carefully managed to ensure sustainability of the resource. But it remains a completely underutilized water um, source on, in Sub-Saharan Africa and on the continent. And then lastly, in terms of climate smart um, outcomes, I also think we should prioritize ecosystem restoration, so forest protection. An estimated 4 million hectares forest land are cut down yearly on the continent. And this is converted into very low yielding agricultural cropland. It's got really negative effects on the continent, it's particularly with regards to soil erosion and its contribution to flooding events. In the last three decades, Africa has lost more than 80 million hectares of forest land. Okay, then the third intervention that we, we did in our scenario was to reduce agricultural losses. Um, so to ensure that the food that is actually produced makes it to the consumer. So the average loss in waste of agricultural produce in Africa is around 24%, and this compares to a global average of around 14%. So the loss rate is very, very high. Some of the reasons behind this is things like a lack of storage facilities. Uh, what we saw in Malawi, for instance, when we visited earlier this year, is that there's a lot of tomato farmers, and then they make their way slowly to the markets. And then once they get to the markets and they're not able to sell their produce, those produce goes to waste no cold storage facilities, um, as well as long commuting times between the production and the actual consumption of those. So um, there's been nice developments in the space of grid cold storage facilities driven by solar, uh, improved supply chain. These are all things that need to be adopted. Okay, and then the improved agricultural commercialization is also important. Uh, here we suggest things like better road infrastructure, particularly to allow, allow farmers to be connected to their markets. This is quite important. Uh, farmers, when they grow their produce, needs to be actually connected to a market to sell those. And of course, I mean, other initiatives like the African continental free trade area, that's going to open up a lot of doors for these markets. Um, you know, a larger consumer basis, but also promoting the trade of various agricultural inputs, uh, better seedlings, fertilizer, modern technologies, farming knowledge, and so forth. And then lastly, um, in the scenario, we also modeled the increase of domestic food consumption. So growing indigenous crops, and then also consuming those indigenous crops and not just relying on imports. All of this, of course, all of these interventions that we've modeled in this agricultural scenario is underpinned by investment in the sector. So the Africa Union is currently leading what they call the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program. And in there, they prioritize and they encourage countries to invest 10% of their national budgets in agriculture, which is something that really is needed if, if the agricultural scenario and um, forecast needs to change. Okay, so these interventions that I've put on the screen here and that we've modeled, they're really not drastic interventions. I just wanna, for instance, show you um, this graph that shows that 
In 2019, we had that graph up. There was about four metric tons per hectare produced um, of crops on the African continent under Africa's current development path. So where it's heading without these policy reforms, we are estimating in 2043, that will be around 5.1 um, hectares, um, uh, 5.1 metric tons per hectare. What we are suggesting with these interventions if they are taken on board, but that will be pushed up to around 7.1 uh, metric tons per hectare. So it's not a, it's not a, it is a, a, a big increase, but it's around a 77% increase in a 20 year time span. So this is very, very achievable and very doable. Many, many African countries have already done similar feats in the last two decades. And if we think of Brazil, I mean, they, they doubled their yields between 1980 and 2000, up from five metric tons to 10 in 20 years time. And then again, up from 10 metric tons to 20 in 20 years time. So this is a very, very achievable um, goal. Okay, so what is the effect of this agricultural scenario that I've shown you have on the sector? And the first effect that I want to show you is just its impact on import dependency. Okay, so the first impact, of course, will be that Africa will produce more food. So by 2050, oh, 2043, we are estimating that Africa will produce an additional 513 million metrics, um, million metric tons of additional food. Um, above what it would have produced under Africa's current development path. So Africa's import bill will reduce, which means less dependency on the international markets and also the volatility thereof. So this translates to malnutrition being reduced. In 2020, there was about 35 million children that was classified as malnourished on the continent. And under the scenario, it's able to drop to 23 million by 2043, and of course, if you take the horizon forward, that will that figure will um, will slowly start shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. So this graph that I'm displaying here shows the import dependency on the continent. So you can see in 2020, um, the the import dependency was 10.6 percent of the crop crop demand, and in the current poll forecast, which is the blue line you can see that this net agricultural crop dependency reaches a very, very high alarming level of 52% by 2043. But the interventions that we've shown and that we've modeled in the IFS, IFS model, you can see that dropping and um, to as low as 3% um, by 2036, you can see that this agricultural scenario has an immediate big impact and then slowly, um, rising again to around 8.5%, so quite a big significant um, thing. Okay, the second impact that I want to want us to look at is its impact on poverty reduction. So in Africa, specifically Africa's low income countries, its low and middle income countries, these are the ones that will benefit most from an agricultural revolution and from the interventions in the agricultural scenario. So Africa is around 40, 46 um, of the 54 member states are either classified as low income or low middle income. So this scenario is particularly potent for those countries. If we look at some of these countries that will benefit, we can see countries like Malawi that can expect an additional 10% um, reduction in poverty above what it would have had in 2043 without the scenario. Okay, By two, we can also see countries like Madagascar, Sierra Leone, Mali, Tungu, um, Central Africa Republic, Mozambique, the DR Congo. All of these countries will have a significant impact in poverty reduction under this scenario. So by 2043, Africa's total economy will be around 407 billion US dollars larger than in the current PAR forecast. And the agricultural scenario will also increase the average GDP per person on the continent by around 234 US dollars. So on its own, it doesn't sound a lot. But remember, when I started the conversation off, I also said that this is the second part of this eight-part Eurodite series. Last week, we looked at the impact that a demographic transition will have and the impact that will have on GDP per capita. Next week, we will look at um, financial, we will look at trade, and then we'll look at education. And all of these little bits add up 
to make a significant impact on GDP per capita on the continent. Okay, so I think in conclusion, um, I just wanna end with some of the recommendations before I hand back over to you, Pamela. If we're just saying that um, we, we really think that Africa should invest in research and development, uh, but particularly around improving its agricultural inputs. That's, that's quite important. And, and that's one of the interventions also that we've modeled. It could prioritize the development um, in rural infrastructure, specifically access roads, storage facilities, and electricity. Um, that's vital to farmers and specifically local subsistence farmers. And also the there's a lot of, lot of work on financial mechanisms to support um, smallholder farmers, a lot of work on the continent, and this should be something that is supported and that is ongoing and that keeps investment into that specific sector. And then the full implementation of a continental free trade area will also expand the markets and it will lift the trade barriers um, to agricultural inputs, but also to accessing those markets. And then the adoption of climate smart agricultural practices. I don't think this can be stretched enough how important this is on the continent, particularly because it is so vulnerable to these natural hazards. And then the land, securing land tenure, that's also fundamental, shifting Africa's agricultural production to a more growth orientated mindset. Okay, and then we can also, I think, just last point, Pamela, before I hand over to you, is just realize, like Yaki said last week, that this is such a growing. Um, continent with so many youth, we should also um, involve those youth in these um, farming and practice and farming for the future practices. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, Pamela, and then I'm going to hand Thank back you. over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. That was really, really, you know, informative to understand also how governments can look at these long-term trajectories and inform their national development plans. There's a question from uh, Darren Michael similar, you know, that's touching on what you've spoken about, about the yields, and he wants to know, how does RSA yields per hectare compare to uh, what you've presented? Maybe you want to just touch on that before we move on to um, another question? Okay, so, so that's South Africa yields, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, so, so to do that, let me share my screen again, and then we um, show the power of the website as well. So to do that, we'll go into a specific country. So I'm going to go to the geographic section on the website, and then I'm going to go to South Africa, and we're going to open up that geographic report. So while I've now got the floor and this is loading, just to say that this website, which was then developed by um, our donor, donor funding, um, you can also download any of these reports. It's open access. It's freely available. You can download the report and it generates a PDF for you to use, but you can also, all the graphs and the figures that I've shown, you can download the data behind that. You can download an image of that graph. You can embed it into your website. So you can really utilize this website and please make use of this website. And it's also an invitation to go and explore that. If we look at South Africa, that was the question that was posed. We go to the agriculture scenario here and we can open up yields. Per hectare. We're going to see two lines. The one is going to be the current path, which again is where we think Africa is heading and the specific South Africa. And then the second line is then the scenario, um, the scenario graph. So here we have got a forecast from 2019. So this is historical data up until we're now currently in 2023, which is about here. And then um, we can see the forecast here. So for 2023, um, we have here 4.9 uh, metric tons per hectare. And this is consistent with, Af with South Africa's crop production in terms of a lot of maize. Uh, maize on itself is a lower yielding producing uh, crop. So if you look at something, for instance, like Mauritius, you would see very, very high yields, which is more sugarcane related. So this is 4.9. And then there are the slow decline forecasts for South Africa. In South Africa's case, this decline would be a result of current policies in play, but it will also be an effect of climate change playing out on, the, on South Africa. We know that South Africa is extremely, extremely vulnerable to drought. We've seen devastating drought events. I mean, we can think back to the previous one in 2015-16, 
but had a big impact on Cape Town's water supply. And um, this, of course, had a big impact on production, um, agricultural production in South Africa as well. So you can see the forecast shows that that is declining and the interventions that has been pr proposed in those scenario. You can see it, um, it increases it before to about 5.1 yields by 2033. And this would also be um, mostly achieved through things like better securing water access, which is a problem, um, and a larger irrigation use, which is also not fully implemented and used in South Africa to its full extent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. I hope that uh, was sufficient to answer your question. Uh, I just want to use this opportunity, and we are really grateful to have on, on, on the call today, um, Hardwick um, Chele is a senior um, agricultural economist for, of, of the World Bank in Pretoria. And he has been in, at the bank now for 17 years and worked in East, uh, South and West African regions. So um, I would like to invite uh, Hardwick uh, you know, to the call to uh, you know, probe some of the, the, the um, uh, presentations that was done by Alice. And if you have any comments, in the meantime, Alice, we have a question also on how do you comment on the prospect of green agriculture and carbon reduction in agriculture in Africa? So um, if, I, if uh, we are ready, we could also hear from then Hardwick on his um, comment regarding the presentation thus far. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you, Pamela. Uh, yeah, I think I would I would start by by thanking the team and particularly Alice for the very clear and excellent presentation that she has made. Uh, the report is obviously very refreshing. It's very clear, both in terms of its analysis, the key messages that it presents, and also the potential implications for agricultural policy. I wish I had a little bit more time to, to go through it, but I think I'll, I'll do that because it obviously has very important information, particularly for the work that we do. Uh, so I think I, I would like to basically say that the conclusions from the report are well documented. Uh, I think what the report says in terms of uh, improving productivity in agriculture through the consistent application of uh, inputs, uh, better technologies, uh, mechanization, irrigation, land reform, and better rural connectivity. I think all those are so critical to improve the trajectory of agriculture in Africa. And if we look at what other regions have done, I think they have transformed their agricultural sectors through undertaking these kinds of uh, uh, investments. Uh, the report has also at least given us a very good run of the good promising practices that are happening even in Africa and how those can be scaled up to at least promote the trajectory towards a positive uh, agricultural transformation. And I also like the analysis of the agricultural scenarios, which largely supports the fact that there is need to undertake consistent uh, reforms, consistent investments, in a number of areas to be able to achieve positive growth uh, into the future. Uh, I think I would share just a few comments for the team's consideration. Uh, these are comments that have come up in the last couple of hours when I start to basically look at the report. And as I said, I definitely see that I would have to take a bit more time also to to go through it after this. Uh, the, first, the first comment is uh, related to how 
to basically promote agricultural policy to undertake the recommendations that the report is bringing forward. Uh, this has always been the key issue uh, because it essentially means that governments have to implement these policies in a very consistent manner and over decades, as has happened in other regions of the world. Yet we know that if we step back and look at what uh, countries have been doing in terms of agricultural policy in the Africa region, you see that it has not been that consistent. I think most of the countries, Alice continued uh, talking about countries like Malawi, for example. And we know that I think in terms of agricultural policy in Malawi, it has, it has actually been dominated by uh, input subsidies, agricultural input subsidies. And what that has done over the years is to crowd out investment into the areas that are actually important and critical for agricultural productivity growth. For example, the budget that goes into implementing agricultural input subsidies is a significant proportion of the overall uh, public expenditure allocated for agriculture. And that means for so many years, it has not been possible to consistently put resources to research and development, for example, uh, irrigation investments, uh, and so many other areas that need to be looked into to promote agricultural growth on a very sustainable and positive path, as the report is saying. So because to be able to move to these uh, progressive policy recommendations would require significant trade-offs, and one of which is basically to look at how subsidies have been implemented uh, in most of the countries in the Africa region. So I would have loved, I would have liked if the report had a little bit delved into this aspect, uh, looking at specific countries that have implemented policies that have basically been retrogressive uh, and not consistent with what one would want to see if we were to be looking at a positive trajectory in terms of agricultural growth, because I do believe that it's not just Malawi, I think it's a number of countries in the Africa region that do implement these politically driven uh, agricultural policies that don't end the countries much in terms of agricultural growth. So the issue is how do we move the policy discussion away from this towards more of these recommendations that are very clearly consistent with what other countries have done around the world to be able to achieve uh, the levels of agricultural growth that we see. So I think if, if the team would probably need to add a little bit more on the policy space to see how some of these policy recommendations can be taken up because of the significant trade-off that has to be considered if we look at the current uh, state of policies. Uh, that's number one. Number two, when I look at the, the, the recommendations, I think a lot of this would probably have to come from significant leveraging of private sector investment in agriculture. I do not believe that even if government was to put all its resources to this sector, it would be possible to achieve the trajectory that we are talking about in the next 20 years. And so the report doesn't say much about what needs to be done to leverage private sector investment into agriculture. Of course, there are aspects like, for example, if we improve rural connectivity and reduce 
the implied market failures, uh, the private sector would see the space as conducive enough to be able to invest. But I think there are so many other aspects of policy, agricultural policy in particular, and probably uh, macroeconomic policies also that affect private sector investment in, in agriculture. And, and I think that to me is a major, major issue. Without drawing in private sector investment into agriculture, it will be difficult for governments alone uh, to be able to realize the growth trajectory that we are talking about. And so I don't see much of that in the analysis that the team has done. I know that obviously, maybe in the scenarios analysis, a scenario like that would, would, would probably help uh, to be able to explain what would be the trajectory if we assume specific levels of private sector investment and then go further than that to say, what would it take for the private sector to be able to consistently invest in the sector like that? Uh, I believe that's something that the team can look at. The, th the third, yeah, the third one and last one is on climate change. I know that the team has, has put in place a, a scenario that is looking at deforestation, but the impact of climate change on agriculture goes beyond just deforestation. I think it's in the Africa region where we are actually dependent on rain-fed systems. The impact goes a lot more, particularly the smallholder sector. And so if, if, if there would be a scenario that looks specifically at climate change, the impact of climate change, and how to promote adaptation, and in some cases, mitigation, I think that would also help. Because obviously, this is a current norm. It will not go away. It will definitely continue to be uh, a major issue in agriculture in, in the Africa region, as, as, as it has been, I think, uh, elsewhere in the world. I think I would stop there, but I, I would like to commend the team for a very good report. And I, as I said, I definitely would go through it in detail. And should there be any other questions that I, I mean, any other comments that I can share, uh, I think I'll be able to do that at some point. But thank you so much for inviting us to this very enriching thank you. discussion. And thank, thank you so much. You, thank you very much for, for your questions. We, we do take into consideration the R&D policy informing, and that's the reason why ISS is actually partnered with the African Union Development Agency so that we can leverage on that policy platform. Uh, we have taken note of, the, of the, the private sector and the impact of climate change. We just have about 15 minutes at least, and what I want to, if you may, I, I just want uh, to mention regarding the productivity of, of food production, you said there'll be an increase um, in, in the coming years. And I would just like you to demonstrate or maybe inform us how this um, uh, you know, increase, whether it's going to be adequate or impact for our population growth that is projected for Africa. Um, maybe you would like to just share uh, some examples. And while you do that, also regarding private sector, um, as you know, the post for the ISS, um, this uh, website is uh, on the chat group. You can, you know, uh, look at it and be ready for the next session that we we uh, have. But just also to let you know that the African Union Development Agency has worked on two papers. We have an effort secretariat in house and on with one specifically on drones on the horizon, transforming Africa's agriculture, and the other is a position paper, the use of the artificial intelligence. And I think that also will bring in the aspect of how private sector and the impact of climate change is addressed in the papers. So thank you for that. And Aliz, I hand over to you now on how the increase of uh, agricultural supply will address our population growth um, in, for the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Pamela. I think I wanna answer that by showing um, Africa's fastest growing country currently with its largest population. So if I'm gonna open um, Nigeria on the screen, as an example, I just want to show Nigeria's, we know that Nigeria is rapidly growing. I mean, it's going to double its population in the next three decades. So up from 200 million to 400 million by mid-century. So this is an enormous amount of population growth. And of course, that population needs to be fed. If we just then look at um, particularly that specific country, um, Nigeria, 
I'm opening the same graph that I showed a little bit earlier, which was for the African continent, but this now specifically is for Nigeria. So this is the agricultural demand in the light um, orange bars here, which you can see is rapidly increasing. So we here, year about 2020, just after 2020, you can see the demand for agricultural produce, and then you can see the demand rapidly, rapidly growing in the next three decades. Again, this is primarily driven by the population growth and a rapidly growing population. And then you can see the demand uh, of the, the supply, sorry, the production side also increasing and picking up speed. But you can see that there's this mismatch between demand and supply and production, actually. And this mismatch translates into food security, insecurity. And this is really the problem that I think I've tried to show on the African continent, but that's very apparent. And countries like Nigeria, DRC, those with large, large, large populations where production is not keeping pace. And this is something that really needs to be addressed. I think, Pamela, I also want to, if it's okay with you, take the opportunity. There's been quite a lot of questions in um, the Q&A around agro processing, oh, not agro processing, sorry, um, a green, green, more sustainability in the sector. How do we get the sector to be climate smart? And then a question around um, the agricultural sector being one of the largest carbon emitters. How do we address that? And then also questions around um, green, green agriculture and the potential for that in Africa. So just to answer that, I just, sorry, just to stop my screen clearing here. It's just to say that we know that Africa, in terms of its green agricultural potential, it's vast because we've got abundance of land resources. And also we have a very, very diverse climate across the African continent. So we really have a lot of potential here. But I think that the biggest Africa is maybe one of its Achilles heels is water. And, and I always say this because it's either too much water or it's too little water. And that is what the African continent needs to, needs to deal with and grapple with. And how do we how do we, in areas where we have little water or, or sporadic water or lots of rainfall variability, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with water in areas where that's hit by cyclones, that's hit by convective storms, large runoffs? So both of those needs to be dealt with. Um, and in some countries, it's both. It is periods of drought that's been followed by periods of flooding, and this has got a detrimental impact on the sector. And I think this is also where there's lots of potential for the continent um, in terms of being climate smart and having agricultural smart, climate smart orientated policies and practices um, in play. So I agree with many of the comments in the chat that said that we should not go the route that, for instance, South America or Asia went of being this industrialization of agriculture and trying to, to do it the same in similar way. And, and that's true because there's so many more modern techniques for instance, if we just look again at the water sector, irrigation, it, it's, it's gone leaps and bounds in its um, technology and technological development. You get smart sensors and monitors that monitors the soil quality, the soil saturation levels, and then according to that, it implements the right amount of water. So it's not just spraying everything with water, it's really being smart about how do you utilize for instance, if you've got little water resources, how do you utilize that little to be optimally effective? Um, the same with flooding. Um, flooding events, for instance, into Ethiopia, they did catchment rehabilitation, which was an ecological systems approach. And that managed to reduce flooding in the agricultural sector. So they used nature itself to restore certain catchment areas to be able to help the agricultural sector downstream. So, so it's definitely having ecosystem-based solutions on the continent, working with, with those nature-based solutions, with the biodiversity that you have, with the climate that you are in, and being smart around that, and using technologies to be smart about this. Um, drones and sensors in the remote sensing world, I mean, they monitor crop quality and soil, con uh, soil nutrition from satellite images. I mean, according to that, you can inform farmers via um, an SMS what they need to do, when they need to plant, when would be the optimal planting season, early warning system. So there's so much technology in this space that's developed. But I think the question is, is, is just getting that technology. And then this also links to what um, the discussion just said, is getting that technology to the local farmers 
and 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 ensuring that they actually have access to that technology and that the, those subsistence farmers can utilize that technology to be able to help their productivity. Thanks, Alice. Uh, just a quick one: where where do you think Africa is in the future of its agro processing? Yes, I think that's also a, a question that that comes from after if you've. If you produce a lot of food and, and you've got domestic food consumption sorted and, and you want to, you know, it needs to trickle down to, to the processing part to be able to, to also stimulate exports and not just um, be in this cycle of, of raw, exporting raw agricultural products. I think a very good example here is the cacao industry. Um, I mean, Africa produces something like 70% of the world's cacao. Um, but it, but it's exported as as a just the cacao is exported as a raw product. It doesn't get converted into um, into, for instance, chocolate. So I think only one percent of the chocolate gets exported from Africa. So that value is is very little that the African continent actually receives. In two thousand sixteen, I think it was something like two billion US dollars that 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 um, was received for um, cacao production. But if we think about Europe, that exports an enormous amount of chocolate. In 2016, their exports were something like 20 billion US dollars for chocolates alone, and they produce no cacao of their own. So, so that's also an imbalance that needs to be fixed. And particularly, I mean, South Africa has got has got a, a better, you know, a better chain of, of processing and exporting and processed goods and so forth. But for instance, Malawi. Um, it's all about domestic consumption, and then that, that which gets exported would be raw produce, as in many other countries. And that is something that's there is a lot of potential to correct mm -hmm. that as well on the continent. Yeah, yeah. There's a comment here on the on the chat. Wouldn't it be more viable and profitable if African agriculture is based primarily on sub-regional and regional quality? Um, I don't think, uh, but uh, you know, I, I leave that to you, Alice. In in the experience of of this work that uh, uh, on this modeling, I particularly think that it, it would not just on on regional policies, but I think regional polit policies is also important um, in order for us to get domestic trade and and intra Africa trade going. So, uh, you do you how would you like to address that question? No, I agree, Pamela. I think it's it, it's all of it. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you need very strong country level policies and support, and sometimes it's about land reform. You need regional trade policies. You need continental wide policies that's around certain aspects. It, it, but definitely, I think it's a it's yeah. more of a combination. Yeah, and on the so website we also, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Uh, if ahead, you look at the D DRC report, if you look at the um, the Horn, the Eastern Eastern Africa report, and if you look at the Malawi report, they they delved a little bit more in depth into the agricultural policies and recommendations and sections, just because that was a, a focus on a country with particular agricultural um, force or, or forecasts, but also particular needs. So you can also look at those, and they are a bit more um, localized, actually. Yeah, yeah, and I think also you know uh, profitability. Africa can deliberate more on adapting sort of regenerative agricultural practices, and I think you know we we're doing that now. Where uh, we just use the resources instead of depleting the ones that uh, and destroying the ones, but utilizing it for you know sufficient end products. I think that's the way to go in terms of addressing the whole. Um, regenerative agricultural processes. And I think, uh, you know, Africa in total can be commended for that in terms of the circular economy and how then waste products are, um, are reused and, and returned into, into consumable products. Um, we really, really appreciate again, Hardwick for the last minute intervention. Your comments uh, have not been, you know, will be definitely taken on board. And we really appreciate some of the in-depth that you have provided um, in analyzing this report. Um, to Alice again, thank you so much for your, your time and for your, your uh, knowledge in sharing on this platform. And we really, really look forward to um, the continuation of uh, the future um, um, you know, uh, foresight on, on various um, thematic areas. And to all our participants, thank you so much for, for your time again. We look forward to the same time next week on the uh, uh, topic um, uh, of the next erudite series on 
I'm trying to look for it. Alice, help me out here. The next session will be on, is it climate? It's next week Friday. It's next week Friday and it's on trade. It's on trade. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody again for, for joining. Uh, we wish you a very good weekend and um, until next week.